Let's get started. So open problems in Web3, what's important and valuable, but falling through the cracks? So first, if you're a student, um, I've actually got a little pipeline and a way that you can approach open problems. And what that means is uh, there's a little pipeline. So do a blog post first, then a GitHub repo, then maybe a microsite, and then and only then a startup. Don't just try to jump directly to a startup. And what do I mean by that? Well, first, what's an open problem? Well, you probably heard this concept of like requests for startups or open problems in math. Um, you know, these are just things which are, uh, you know, often unsexy problems, but funding is likely available if you solve them. And they're things that if you're, you know, at the cutting edge or just involved in the space, you'll be able to see, but you might not be able to see from just sort of the surface coverage of Web3, which talks a lot about price, right? And so when you're tackling any kind of open problem or really, you know, almost anything in tech, here is a process that I recommend, especially if you are a student and you're, you're doing like a side project kind of thing. First, write a review like Jay Graber here, for example, wrote a review of decentralized social networks. That was actually something that, you know, I, I talked to her about beforehand. And then actually about a year later, she is um, running uh, Twitter's Blue Sky project in part on the strength of her work. And, you know, this review also just helped her pull some, some concepts together, you know, very meritorious you know, person. So you write a review and that review might travel further than you expect. It's a way to kind of put your concepts down and you get some value out of it. If you're doing any, you know, embarking on something, then if you feel more strongly, then actually write some code and make that public. Okay. Put that on GitHub. And then if, if you really, you know, are getting somewhere, then set up a microsite and tweet that out, share that, mention it to the people in your area, just like a, you know, something like CARD.co or one of these microsite generators, you just share a one page site. It's hosted, it's at its own domain, but it looks good. It's got your code there and maybe your review linked. And then and only then, if you're getting a lot of, getting a lot of positive feedback from this, then maybe do a startup. The reason I, I recommend this pipeline is this is like maybe a day or so of work. This is like, I don't know, maybe like a few weeks of work, this is presenting your work to the public, and this is actually monetizing it. And if you have a lot of different side projects, this allows you to try a bunch of things and get some useful artifact for your portfolio before committing years of your life and you know life energy to, to, to a startup, right? So it gives you stopping points, lets you test the waters. So that's a macro framework for all the things that I discussed today. If you're interested, start with number one, write a review on them, you know, then maybe number two. So I'm just giving you a bunch of threads you can pull on and I advise you to tackle them in this order and only do a startup if you're really committed to it and you've thought about this and you're interested in the area for a long time. And if you are, then you can DM me or, you know, many other folks in the area and, and we're happy to talk to you, invest in you, maybe, you know, advise you, whatever. Okay. All right. So with that as sort of prelude as to how to tackle these open problems, let's talk about uh, the list of open problems in Web3. One thing to remember, by the way, is Web3 is, in a sense, a boring backend technology. It's only a set of fundamental 10x improvements in the things like speed of setting up an account, right? Rather than days to go and open a bank account, it's fractions of a second for an Ethereum address or Bitcoin address. Rather than, you know, days to send an international wire, it's, again, you know, a few seconds, you know, you send a, an Ethereum transaction, you refresh in the browser and you see it. Um, rather than a few million dollars in a crowdfund, you know, the largest crowdfund in 2015 was about like $15 million. You can raise billions of dollars in a crowdfund and on and on. It's fundamentally a backend technology that just is an improvement in many different kinds of things from account creation to digital signatures, to login, to payments, to incorporation, to blah, blah, blah. All these internet backend technologies get improved with Web3. Only really the price is the flashy thing on the front end, and it can be flashy in both a positive and a negative direction. Um, this is very different than, you know, for example, AI content creation, which looks amazing once it works, right? Um, with Web3, it's a back-end technology, and so a lot of things I'm going to talk about today are really back-end technologies. So first kind of open problem, just give a flavor, okay? And all of them will kind of be like this. How do we decentralize social media login? So at the top, there'll be sort of a red tinted thing, which is kind of the, you know, like current status quo, not so great. And then what might, you know, the green tint thing at the bottom is a possible solution. Okay. So at the top, we've got login with Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, and Twitter. One of the major approaches to decentralizing social media is to replace this with something called ENS um, or, or something like it, where you log in with Ethereum rather than these services. And the key difference is your private keys are held locally on your computer. So these services can't disrupt you. There's an article that a colleague of mine wrote uh, called the Billion User Table, which you can read about this. And the basic concept is uh, once you've got an ENS profile, like here's bologs.eth, okay, it's got 
um, a bunch of parameters there. It's like a profile that you can port between apps. So like your Facebook profile, you can, in theory, you could log out of it as, uh, you know, and then and log into Twitter with the same thing. ENS gives you this sort of portable profile. So this is one way of decentralizing social media. Question is, how do we decentralize social media via decentralizing social media login? Another approach to decentralizing social media is to decentralize the entire backend, okay? And so DSO is one prominent example. There's This is a so-called app chain. And in this case, you're not just decentralizing the login. Every single action is on-chain. There's likes, there's updates, updating profiles. Every single action is on-chain. So this is like a heavyweight way of doing it. Um, and so if you're interested in social media, you can either decentralize the login or you can decentralize the entire backend, okay? Call those two open problems in Web3. Here's another one, which is um, what does optimal DAO tooling look like? Now, the term DAO, you may have heard of it. It's a, it's a misnomer. Um, you know, it means digital autonomous organization. And most, quote, DAOs are not autonomous. It's not like a code that's just executing totally dispassionately. Bitcoin is kind of, you know, totally dispassionate. There's a few smart contracts like Augur that are just code executing on chain without any humans interacting with them. But many DAOs might better be referred to as tokenized communities, that is say communities that have some kind of crypto component. And right now what people use is they use Discord, which is kind of like a like a Slack for gaming that many of you are familiar with. And you can kind of jump between rooms and so on. But Discord wasn't built for crypto. It isn't crypto native. It's kind of a stopgap. What is crypto native? There's a zillion projects in this area, but fundamentally, what, what is a, a DAO or what is a tokenized community? It integrates concepts from both social media and traditional companies. And so you're basically taking like a like a company and putting it on chain and merging that with a community so that like a Facebook group or a Discord group would suddenly have a treasury and it'd have governance, like Snapshot is a tool for managing governance, and it'd have an interface with a fiat system. And so this is a massive area where you can build a lot of different companies just in this. Um, it's sort of like, you know, going from social media to social corporations in a sense, right? Social companies, social uh, or, or, or crypto communities. Um, so the, you know, this is just an open problem, an area you can get into. Just Google the concept of DAO tooling. Um, there's there's a zillion products here. I can't review them all, but basically now your Facebook group has a treasury. Now it's got because it's got a treasury, it's got real stakes. Something like Snapshot is for governance, and because it's got a treasury and real stakes, um, you know, the the legal system wants to get involved. And so places like Wyoming have given legal recognition. So it's like the fiat interface, but not for not from cryptocurrencies to fiat currencies, but uh, crypto companies to, to fiat companies or crypto communities to fiat you know, communities, okay? So that's the third open problem. What does optimal DAO tooling look like? Here's the next question, which is how could you tokenize an open source project? So, um, you know, Nadia Egbal has this great, you know, uh, book called Working in Public, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. She talks about how, you know, financing open source is actually quite difficult. And one concept I have, I have this tweet thread here, which is, um, you know, written in a, I guess, a 4chan-ish style or whatever, uh, you know, be open source dev, issue a token, hold X percent of it, and then award pieces of it over time to folks who contribute code and companies who then buy the token so that they can get bug fixes prioritized. This is one way of prior, you know, sort of tokenizing open source. Okay. Could you allow open source developers to make money from a token? This is another potential application of, of Web3, uh, another open problem. Another concept. Um, Postgres basically is, you know, a very popular, you know, relational database and every single one of these, you know, every company out there in crypto, certainly every crypto exchange, um, everybody's implementing various bridges to all of these different blockchains and crypto assets out there. And rather than reinventing the wheel, could you abstract it? And just like so, something called post GIS, it pulled, um, geo queries. So you're, you're pulling in X and Y queries, uh, you know, find every car within, you know, a mile of, of this X, Y coordinate. That's a continuous query as opposed to the discrete query of looking something up in a traditional relational database. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the thing is that basically any, everyone building anything in web three ends up reinventing this bridge. So maybe you can just build something like a post chain over here. Um, this is similar to what we did at Coinbase. And this would be a very valuable thing in the space. You might be able to tokenize this yourself. Um, and so essentially a Postgres binder uh, or set of Postgres bindings for blockchains, it's very similar to the Postgres bindings for geographical stuff. I think that could be a very big thing. That's another open problem. Okay. Next, 
Another question, how do we migrate between blockchains? So you might start on one blockchain, like Blockstack started on Bitcoin, migrated somewhere. Binance started on Ethereum, migrated somewhere else. Um, you might start with a centralized database. You might start with something like Stack Overflow Karma. You might start with a token, and then you move some assets or all of them to another chain. Um, this is something which is becoming more common. There's other kind of things that are sort of related, not moving the entire chain, but individual assets with atomic swaps or cross-chain bridges. But this is an area of how do we migrate and more generally interoperate between blockchains that is an open thing. Next concept is, you know, another open area. How do you quantify and optimize decentralization? Uh, you know, when you talk about the legal structure, people talk about whether a token or coin is quote, sufficiently decentralized. People knock each other out on Twitter about this all day. Oh, your thing is not decentralized enough. And um, you know, I have a post on this from five years ago that I think has held up reasonably well, which is how to quantify decentralization. And the intuition here is um, a system is only as decentralized as its least decentralized subsystem. So if you can capture three entities and thereby choke point all mining for, for a given coin, or if you can capture two developers and thereby choke point all development for that asset, um, then that's actually the, the least decentralized part. And it's uh, Nakamoto coefficient is like three in the first case or two in the second case. How many entities, what's the minimum number of entities you need to compromise to compromise the system? The reason that you want to do something like that is first is it takes it out of the domain of just stupid Twitter argumentation as to what is more or less decentralized. And you can say more or less decentralized on what axis, number one. And then number two is given scarce resources, once you can quantify something, then you can minimize or maximize that. You can pu punch it into an optimization algorithm. Um, and so quantifying decentralization, I think is important and building a dashboard on this, I think will be a, will be a good thing. Next concept, um, how do we visually unify coin tables and cap tables? So cap tables, the, the, the capitalization table of a company like Carta or AngelList, um, these are billion dollar you know, services that just manage the most, basically the most important data structure in tech is not um, you know, a skip list or a, or a B tree, it's a, it's a cap table, right? The most important data structure in tech is the table of who owns what shares. Similarly, there's quote, and it's just kind of an interesting turn of phrase, coin tables, where your stakes in various coins, those are managed on crypto exchanges. But just like the DAO thing, you'll probably want to manage eventually your equities and your cryptocurrencies in one interface where you can see your cap table and you can see your coins all in one thing, a combined web dashboard, especially for a company that has much of both. Can we visually unify that? That's an open problem. Um, related to this is, can we automate accounting with triple entry bookkeeping? The thing is double entry bookkeeping was this huge breakthrough in the past where um, you were you know, recording both a debit and a credit. Uh, and triple entry bookkeeping has the blockchain serve as effectively a third entry on every transaction. The reason this is so important is if you're ever a crypto company and you are um, having, a, you know, you're generating so-called audited financials um, and you have a PwC or, or, or one of the big four that's auditing you, they nowadays will actually true up your transactions versus the Bitcoin or Ethereum blockchain, because they think of that as a go global gold standard of truth. And um, that's just this completely new thing where um, basically... Um, you know, you, you have something which was called a scam, Bitcoin and Ethereum were called scams. And now the big four are using them as a global gold standard of truth because of triple entry bookkeeping. This is a huge thing um, where, you know, as you can see, there's, you know, the distributed ledger that's the third entry. It allows, it's like a breakthrough in accounting. Um, it's a it's a breakthrough in in a bunch of things um, in, in, in fraud protection, as I'll get to even for advertising, as, as I'll get to in a second. But basically, now that lots of companies are starting to use at least USDC or other stable coins or things like that in part, can you fully automate accounting? Could you generate streaming accounting? Could you have it something where the books aren't just closed every 30 days or something like that, but because the entries are on chain, you write a script and you just generate income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. Could you do a, a crypto version of NetSuite? This would be a multi, multi-billion dollar company if you can pull it off. There's probably multiple billion dollar companies in here. Basically, can you automate accounting? Um, and you might do that for, you know, uh, like, like a crypto company or, um, you know, somebody who's got most of their assets on chain, that's a small demographic today, just like people who spent most of their time online in the year 2000 were a small demographic, but many more, much larger percentage of society spent more hours online by 2010, and especially by 2020. In the same way, you know, the, the percentage of people who have 50% of their assets in on-chain things 
is a small percentage of the world today, but it'll be a much larger percentage by 2030. And I think an even larger percentage, probably the majority of the world by maybe 2040. And so fully automated accounting is possible with blockchains, something to take a look at. Related thing is, can we put Sandhill on chain? So there's all of these terms that have become conventional in venture. Uh, you know, pre-money and post-money and, you know, lockups and vesting schedules and so on. And what happened was crypto just unlocked everything. And it was just like, you know, just oceans of capital moving around the world. And now what we might want to do is some sort of Hegelian synthesis with, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and say, perhaps some of those VC conventions were actually good if we can bring them back in an opt-in way. For example, lockups, vesting schedules, um, you know, that type of thing, right? Uh, drag along, uh, et cetera. Could we put those on chain? And what you might do is you might start with a very a toy example of setting up a company where it's you know represented on chain and then having it acquired by another actor. Again, this is a toy example. And then you you shut down, you run the waterfall, and then you do it if there's a series A round, then you do there's a series B round, and and so on and so forth. And you just build up and you do like a hundred examples of more and more complicated companies being set up and then acquired or set up and paying out dividends, all with just toy on-chain models that don't actually reflect a real company, but show how it could be done. And in this fashion, you kind of put Sandhill on chain. And I think that'd be a very valuable contribution if somebody wants to do that. Um, you need to know Ethereum and you need to know something about venture. You need to put those two people together, but there's there's a fair number of people, a VC associate and one of you could probably, probably do it, right? So somebody maybe who's a few years older, who's graduated and working at a VC fund would know a bunch of these terms. Um, so many VC lawyers. Okay. So um, another concept, can we get a dashboard of dashboards? So there's a bunch of these dashboards in crypto, coin market cap, DeFi pulse, crypto fees.info, mainly because the backends of crypto are, are, are open, right? So you can scrape and, and, and visualize things, but there's a bunch of them, right? Could you create maybe a Yahoo style index of them? Indexed by coin, open sourceness, and other variables. You know, Dune Analytics has done pretty well here, um, but uh, you know, you might, you know, there's Nansen, there's a few others. This feels like an important area. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just something where I, I don't know the exact right approach. I'm proposing a Yahoo style index. Maybe it's like a search engine for dashboards. Um, but, but it feels like all of these different dashboards, um, you know, maybe you can generate something, which is a, a dashboard of dashboards. So, you know, you recommend which dashboard somebody should be looking at if they like these other ones, you know, um, there's enough of them out there that you could now do that. Uh, another concept, can we develop user aligned metrics? Okay. So the internet basically, you know, allowed us to get something which you now take for granted, which is individual metrics on every single article. And one of the consequences of that is you have places like Buzzfeed that just generate huge numbers of clicks for terrible things. Right. Um, and you know, they, they, they essentially are just traffic optimized, not, you know, truth optimized, but an interesting question is. Uh, now that we've got crypto, we've got Web3, can we do new kinds of metrics? And I think we can. Basically, um, you know, let's say, you know, think about like men's health, right? What does men's health look like in the time of Fitbit? Does, or, or what does Bloomberg look like in, in, in the time of crypto? Is the information you're consuming from this source actually boosting your portfolio? So what I mean by that is... Um, like when you consume, uh, you know, content from Bloomberg or you're subscribed to some financial outlet, is there a cause effect relationship where your portfolio is actually going up? You know, you, you, you consume this information, your portfolio is going up in some sort of causal way, or is it, um, is it just infotainment and you're just kind of reading about stuff that makes you think, you know, about money, but you're not actually gaining anything. Similarly with, uh, you know, men's health, are you just reading it or are you actually getting fitter? you know, it's sort of a cause and effect relationship. How does the blockchain enter here? Well, it's possible to collect provable metrics from individuals in a way that really wasn't possible before. For example, you know, your portfolio can actually be reported on chain and potentially other kinds of things like your Fitbit could become a so-called crypto oracle and start putting data on chain um, and it becomes harder to falsify. And then you could collect all of that. You could prove it both to other users and to yourself that you're actually um, boosting performance. I think it's easier to start with financial things because that's on chain right now. But over time, you could imagine other kinds of things like user aligned metrics, user aligned content. Another concept for, for DAOs, okay? Uh, and I know I'm going through a bunch of stuff and I'll take questions, but I'm just giving like a tour of many different kinds of open problems. Maybe one of them will pique your interest. So, um, you know, there's this concept called a principal agent problem. Every time a CEO is delegating something 
to a employee or um, and you know an LP to a VC, there's a divergence possible. You know, ideally they both win together or they lose together if a company goes bankrupt. But it's possible that the principal could win and the agent could lose or vice versa. For example, the principal, um, you know, uh, th they sell the company, but this guy doesn't get any money or conversely, this guy uh, doesn't work hard, but collects a salary. And then the principal, you know, you know, has, uh, is, is out of money. There's possible to have win loss and loss win things. And every single edge in an org chart has another principal agent problem on it. Okay. So, um, in a DAO, you could actually maybe make that explicit. You could say, okay, every edge in this org chart, what is the game theory there? Um, you know, in a, in a remote company, you need to think about this more concretely. Um, can you automate some of those nodes and, or can you kind of have permissions on them where, you know, this person's a contractor and they've got certain permissions. Can you, can you lock down access control? Who can do what with the treasury? Essentially you make roles in an org chart much more defined as in, you know, your role in our chart is a function of your access control. Right. Um, and so DAOs sort of mean you have to kind of think from scratch, what is a company and how can you sort of digitize these things that we sort of take for granted, the interactions between people. So you're balancing principal agent issues, you know, maybe more explicitly. Next question. This is related to the triple entry bookkeeping thing. Right now you have so-called CPM and CPC advertising. These are the engines of Google and Facebook and other online advertisers, but especially these two. So CPM is cost per thousand. You know, M is a thing. It's, it's milla. Uh, people always think it's mega, which is millions, but it's cost per thousand, which is stupid. When a user views the ad and CPC is cost per click when a user clicks on the ad. What you really want as a as a retailer is CPA, which is user buys a product. For example, your your Casper mattresses, you're selling mattresses online, okay, and um, essentially the uh, when it, when a user buys a product, you're selling a five hundred dollar mattress. Let's say then and only then are you happy to pay Google fifty bucks or whatever it is for the for the action, right? The issue is that um, unless maybe you're implementing Google Pay. Uh, uh, any other payment mechanism is something where either you or Google have an incentive to, you know, just like the, the numbers are not, you know, necessarily lined up. For example, um, Casper mattresses could say, oh, you know, those sales don't count. We didn't get that many sales. And Google could say, oh, these sales do count. And so they're kind of off. What they really need is a fourth party different from both the customer from Casper and from Google to testify that a transaction took place, took place at this time, it took place through this channel and for this amount. And that's where that blockchain comes in. So it's possible that you could revolutionize advertising with triple entry bookkeeping because you now have this neutral third party attestation that a transaction happened for this amount um, that anybody can integrate that's got you know good payments and so on. So this is actually a reason for merchants potentially to accept crypto if they can get full CPA ads. And there's uh, folks like, you know, Antonio Garcia Martinez is working on that, um, you know, invest in his thing, but there's a bunch of other folks working on this. And I think this is an interesting area. And this is what I mean by Web3 being a backend technology is, you know, the ledger allows you to now do actions that are informed by the ledger, which you couldn't have done before, right? Um, Another question, can we fairly benchmark blockchains? This is another thing where people just slug it out on Twitter. My blockchain is faster, has better performance, L2, this and that. So there's um, a, a thing called the computer language benchmark scheme, which is intentionally sort of arch in how it discusses things. It says, you know, which programming language is fastest, you know, um, and uh, they just have a bunch of different benchmarks and they make it into a game where every language proponent can kind of put together the best benchmark. And um, something like that, but for blockchain benchmarks, where you have a set of open source benchmark programs to measure things like time to download the blockchain, time to verify it, um, you know, like how fast, how many transactions can be run, et cetera. And anybody should be able to run that suite and then make pull requests, just like there is, you know, this, this suite of benchmarks for, you know, different programming languages. I think this would be a very popular site. And you'd get a lot of, you have to just do it exactly right where every coin tribe can put in their own pull requests and be as neutral as possible. You know, you're running, I don't know, UFC or Switzerland um, and just have fun doing it rather than being pro any one coin. And, and I think it'd be a really interesting site. Um, UFC plus Switzerland is kind of a funny thing. Uh, 
oh, I, I think I talked about this, but I'll just say relatedly, a Web3 login widget, moving from passwords to private keys, can we go from the old school login widget to a simple new cross-service decentralized login widget? This kind of is similar to the social media login thing of before, but it's a little broader than that because there's ENS, there's Handshake, there's Urbit, there's BitCloud or DSO. There's a bunch of these kinds of things that are out there. And can you make a you know a cross platform? There's Solana name services. There's quite a few of these. Can we have, can we have something that's kind of looking like this? Um, can we enumerate the nouns and the verbs? Okay, so one way of thinking about cryptocurrency is you have these verbs like buy, sell, send, receive, earn, stake, etc. And you also have the nouns, which are like the miner, the holder, the staker, the developer, this, that, right? You start thinking about the nouns and the verbs and you start thinking about your ecosystem and then like what verb is followed by what noun, you know? You buy and then you sell. You send and then you receive or you receive and then you send, right? And uh, you, you stake and then you... Um, you know, well, you earn from staking, right? So how do how do those nouns and verbs, you know, like how do they connect? Here's like an example of them literally in the Coinbase app, buy, sell, convert, for example. It's different from sell, right? You, you're kind of not selling it for fiat, you're converting, it's a crypto, crypto trade, which is different. Um, and, and thinking about these, it's sort of like thinking about the various actions on, you know, the web, there's share and there's download. So there's icons, there's a visual language. It's a whole set of things that go with these verbs that, um, you know, are, are useful to actually concretely think about. You start thinking about which different chains enable which things. For example, private sending like Zcash is different than just sending, you know, transparently. Sometimes you want it to be totally transparent so you can get a receipt on chain. Sometimes you want it to be totally private. If you're living under China's digital yuan, for example, you might want, you know, Zcash or something like that much more, right? Can we get a status dashboard for assets? So if you've got a lot of assets, just like you know Amazon, for example, tells you shipped, unshipped, canceled, partially shipped. You know you've got a status update: how many minutes remaining on a download? Your status on WhatsApp. Um, the more assets you have, the more of a pain it is to track where their state is. It's a huge deal for each guy who's la launching an asset. They're like, oh, you know, it's our big launch tomorrow, but you know, th there's claiming and there's forks and there's this and there's that. You have to pick up your coins, migrate something. This again is kind of a popular site if you put it together, which is just like, you know, maybe you plug in your list of coins and then you get back, uh, you know, what you're supposed to be doing next, what the key dates are, and maybe they're automated or whatever. It has to be a high trust site or ideally a local app, which you can audit, but this feels like, like a valuable thing. Okay. I know there's a rapid fire thing of about 20 open problems in crypto. Uh, if you decide to tackle any of them, you know, we'll, we'll share the slides so you can kind of read them. If you build any of them, I'm at twitter.com, Balajs, can offer advice, et cetera. And maybe I can just take some, take some questions now. All right, a lot of Q&A. So um, I'll just go through them in time order from the top. Should I do that, Dawn? Uh, yes, that'd be great. Okay, great. All right, so just going from the top, um, what do I think of Urbit specifically as a potential platform for DAO tooling? Um, I think it's very promising. There's a site called, uh, you know, Urbit is decentralized Discord that you can look at. So take a look at that. Um, it's it's not it's neither succeeded nor failed yet, and but I think it could succeed. It just needs to really embrace interop if it's going to do that. Um, it needs to be, it needs to beat Discord on its own merits, um, and that's a non-trivial thing. Um, the alternative to Urbit is just snapping together a bunch of individual pieces like ENS for the naming and you know, snapshot or something like that for governance and something else for treasury management. But Urbit could be a full stack thing, but it has to kind of it, it has to beat Discord on its own merits for that. And Discord is a, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar company that's just doing chat, right? So uh, it's possible that it needs to actually embrace the problem. Um, so uh, you know, basically, um, do I think it's projects people token as a GitHub code? So I think it's an open problem. How do I deal with competition here? Um, I think it's an open problem because we don't all have like a name recognized thing. It's kind of like uh, when Dropbox started, um, they they said, um, you know, there's a bunch of file services out there. And, and Drew Houston's question was, do you use them? You know, and, uh, you know, there's probably some that have some traction. Um, Gitcoin, I think, is actually quite good. You know, I'm a small investor in that. There's others, you know, th that are out there. Um, how do I deal with competition? I think, you know, we're so early in this thing that it's, you know, you, you probably want to want to see more, um, where to read data on USDC, small business adoption, uh, maybe on circles website. Uh, but I don't know, uh, actually on that, a lot of stats like that aren't tracked right now, but, um, you could, 
you know, you might do like, uh, you might search for USDC addresses on Google or, or try some strategy on, along those lines. Uh, maybe either scan might be better. You should try to analyze, you know, if there's any people who have quote, self docs themselves on chain intentionally, businesses sometimes have quote, docs addresses or they're receiving it .eth addresses. Um, what are some of the more TradFi companies that are trying to implement? Let me actually try clicking this answer live button. <laughs> Okay, there we go. What are some of the more TradFi companies that are trying to implement automated accounting and including crypto and blockchain tech? Um, I mean, PwC and Deloitte and others have all written about automated accounting. I don't actually think any of them are going to be able to implement it, but they might be able to use a tool chain that you develop. I think it's going to have to start with crypto natives doing it for crypto native companies. Like crypto is like a country that's like expanding. And it's got a few million people. It's like hundreds of millions of holders. And you've got like a few million people who are just totally on chain for everything. And you just start there with the presumption that just like the internet expanded until everybody had it, you start with something that's like a seemingly niche service. And then as the space expands, your market expands with it. Um, so that's what I do. I just start with, you know, crypto. I don't think TradFi companies will easily be able to do it. Um, so uh, Jason is quite against crypto VC. Do I think crypto makes a better sand hill? Um, you know, I, I agree with Jason on some things. I disagree with Jason on other things. Um, I've been, you know, being on all in and we're co-investors on a bunch of deals and disagree on whatever, some stuff, some stuff, um, on, um, on crypto, particularly, I think it is easy to see, um, like just out of control prices going up and down and so on. And then just write off the whole thing as, as a function of that. And that'd be, I think a mistake in a similar way to writing off, uh, the internet after the dot-com bubble of the early 2000s. And more generally, if you read Carlota Perez, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like the, the book that gives the intellectual foundations behind something called the Gartner hype cycle, almost everything that humans have done, you know, technologically, we go back to railroads, you see a similar kind of thing with a huge boom of a lot of speculative investment, then a crash, and then like a, a rise to adoption where it's not as flashy, but it's working, you know? And so do I think crypto makes a better sand hill? Yes, I do. Um, and why? Uh, I wrote this article called Thoughts on Token several years ago. Um, but first of all, uh, it allows people overseas to raise money. It allows um, anybody to become an investor so that you know anybody could become an investor in Bitcoin or Ethereum, but you need to be on Sand Hill or in the Bay Area to invest in Facebook or Google early on. Um, it allows for cross-border transactions, even as China and the US and others are getting more nationalist and, and sort of hostile to this, um, you know, like international capitalism survives online or rather on chain. Um, if you're in Brazil and, and Bangladesh and you want to do a deal together, the Ethereum blockchain is a neutral global rule of law. Bitcoin is something that both of you can hold and value. And that's actually incredibly valuable as, you know, countries that were facilitating global trade you know, kind of retreat from that role, the on-chain environment is a way to kind of keep that going. So yes, I do think, you know, crypto makes a better sand hill um, in the same way that, you know, the internet makes a better version of almost everything else. It's, uh, you know, lots of these things, you know, Hollywood is that that's going to be totally, you know, decentralized with AI, um, education with MOOCs, basically lots of these things that were sort of metonyms, you know, uh, geographical locations that are stand-ins for something like Sand Hill or Silicon Valley was a stand-in for technology. That's all getting decentralized now. And I think crypto is assisting that. So yes, I do think crypto makes a better Sand Hill, but we have to take those terms like vesting and lockups and and so on and turn them into terms that you can have in on-chain contracts that people can opt into. And I think there's, there's value in Sand Hill uh, and a value in a lot of those conventions and we can kind of, you know, take those further. Okay. Next, um, <clears throat> on the provable side of user line metrics, isn't blockchain another tool layer on top of traditional ways of authentication and validation? How does it contribute to reducing gaming, falsifying at the entry level, even if you're collecting metrics via new edge device integration enabled sources? Um, yeah, so, uh, so the answer is, uh, there's kind of two parts, right? The first is, once it's written to the blockchain, it's hard to falsify the history and rewrite it. Okay. So that's like one, one part of the answer. Okay. The second part is the thing you're talking about, which is let's call it the analog digital interface, which is of course, simply putting something on chain doesn't make it true. It makes it harder to falsify once it's on chain, but you could write 
garbage to the blockchain in theory. So there's a couple of answers on that. First is if a manufacturer is distributing a device, like, you know, let's say the Fitbit scale or something like that, um, a relatively small percentage of people will be able to hack that device and muck with the signing process to write, you know, on-chain data that is that is wrong, number one. Number two is I gave a talk at Chainlink recently on so-called auditable oracles, where um, you, you essentially randomly sample some subset of those folks, which a crypto oracle is reporting, and then you can compare predicted versus actual and get a sense of the reliability of that oracle. With random sampling, you can get pretty good bounds. For example, you know, let's say there's 10,000 people that are reporting their weight. Um, you randomly sample 100, you actually remeasure them if, if they, you get permission to do so, and, uh, and then you see what it is, right? And, uh, or, or you could do that if it's not people, you take it with real estate, you've got an Oracle that's reporting 10,000 pieces of real estate and they're, they're square meters and you sample and you get a hundred and you do that. Uh, and you see if they're the actual numbers you measure are the same as what the Oracle is reporting. So that's the second measure method, which is audible oracles. And a, a third method is um, you might have an instrument that actually is sort of hashing the individual floating points. So if it's like a sequencing machine, for example, um, there's a lot of metadata, which is written in an experiment's description already. And you can imagine um, coupling, you know, maybe individual TIFF files or, or, or raw data files with a hash and putting that on chain such that it'd be challenging to falsify it because um, the, the sort of information supply chain was hashed. And so um, you'd have to falsify it in such a way that you're sort of hacking the, the firmware. Again, similar to the first example, but even more granular, where you're not just, it's not just the weight that you're putting on chain, but you're putting intermediate computations that would be hard to decipher. Um, so those are various ways that you can do it. I'm not saying any of those are foolproof, but they're essentially ways of sort of hardening the analog digital interface and then making it audible. Uh, can I talk a little bit more about the nouns and verbs problem? Why is it important? Well, basically what it does, is it kind of tells you what the, once you actually kind of enumerate them, you start seeing how the various, um, how, how the ecosystem interoperates. Um, and you start thinking about what the right golden path for something is. Uh, you know, for example, um, once you download a PDF, you probably want to click open, right? Download is a verb followed by open. And so, you know, that's that's something where if you're thinking about user interfaces or workflows, um, you know, download is probably not fo followed by, um, I don't know, reboot the computer or something like that. The reboot button would be the, a wrong thing to show right after you do download. Instead, you want to show the open button. So once you understand the, the nouns and the verbs, what verb follows what other verb, what verb precedes what other verb, um, and sometimes these are non-obvious, like, you know, for example, um, in order to sell within a crypto exchange, you need to first buy or you need to receive, right? So the sell thing is not something that you want. You, how do you get the, the money in first? Um, you know, well, you, you don't want to make sell very prominent until someone has either deposited funds via receive or bought them, right? These are just sort of obvious, but on their hand, non-obvious because, the sequence of operations, once you do it out, it informs your user interface, how you think about it. Um, you start to see, for example, the level of onboarding. Let's say you want to buy an NFT on chain. Okay. For someone to totally start from scratch, first, they need to set up you know, a USD bank account on a crypto exchange, then get USD for ETH, then get an ETH wallet and move the ETH in there, then use the ETH wallet to buy the NFT and then custody it locally. That's a sequence of steps. Now, of course, you can use OpenSea or something like that, try doing it directly. but once you see a long chain of verbs, you can try to compact that down, sort of like what Twitter did. You know, originally microblogging was taking a bunch of different steps and a bunch of different verbs of you know write a post, preview it, um, you know upload it, etc. And then you know, like it was, it was just compacting that down, right? Um, so that's one of the reasons to look at the verbs. It just lets you kind of see the whole thing. Um, what I think about software track crypto taxes and compliance, I think it's very valuable. I think there's going to be a bunch of them. Um, you know, I'm an investor in coin tracker, a bunch of other things, um, important area, um, in terms of for privacy, for the triple entry idea, my only concern would be privacy. Could ZK proofs be used to tackle this problem? Does it need to make all the information public? Absolutely. ZK proofs or viewing keys, um, or, you know, fancier things like secure multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, potentially, uh, depending on the application, some, you know, maybe a government agency might want every, it to be totally public. For other kinds of things, you might want it to be selectively public or selectively private. And I think there's a whole gradation of these things that are going to be application specific. 
what countries do I see leading Web3 entrepreneurship in the near future? Well, probably not China um, because they've like tried to ban a lot of it. Um, maybe half of America, but I think a lot of the world that is neither America nor China um, is going to get into it because they don't control root, you know, in the, in the system. Basically what Web3 is about is giving digital property rights. It is valuable for those who are not root users to the system. China has root over WeChat and the digital yuan. Uh, the US establishment, they have root over, you know, effectively Google and, you know, PayPal and others. But if you're India, if you're Israel, if you're Brazil, um, if you're a fairly large country, but you don't quite have the scale of, you know, the Chinese, uh, you know, the, the Chinese, um, uh, you know, CCP uh, controlled, you know, companies or the U.S. establishment, then you're probably going to go into Web three, and I and I do think that's the medium to long term solution. I wrote a foreign policy article on this. Um, you can uh, here's the title of it. Um, it's titled um, <clears throat> "Great Protocol Politics" from last year, um, and it's basically about how uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin Ethereum are important things for geopolitics because they are technopolitics. They allow countries to have sovereign transaction and communications channels. Um, hi, Balaji. Have any of the beliefs about your book changed since you've written of it or flip side, any components of building a network state you think more strongly of? Um, I don't know, beliefs, I, you know, I put this out, I put the networkstate.com. If you guys have heard of it, it's um, that's where it's at. It's at the networkstate.com. I, I put it out July 4th, just about three months ago. Um, and um, I think I, I'm not. Just, I don't think any of my quote beliefs have changed per se. It's a relatively short time frame, but I've gotten useful feedback, uh, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to ship a version one and get feedback, um, a little bit less than the stodgy book process of you know first time and it's done. Learned a lot while writing one. We'll we'll incorporate all that into the next version. I think what I'm going to do in the future, you know, just as a sort of preview, I'm going to separate it out into like motivation theory and practice, which is sort of my own idiosyncratic or worldviews or what have you. Um, then specific theory of why network states are possible based on a bunch of historical examples from the past, technological things from the future, um, current things that are happening. So putting all that together into the theory chapter, just pulling it and reorganizing a bit. And then practice getting really down to brass tacks on, you know, people are like, where, well, who's going to build the roads and whatever. And I'm like, Who's ever built the roads? It's engineers, you know, it's civil engineers. Um, and it's, it's like, if you can do computer science and math, you can, you're, you're overlapping, let's put it like that, with the skills to, you know, build a truss or, um, you know, to, to, to build a bridge. Um, and uh, so the, the point being that, um, you know, I got feedback on it. And uh, if you have feedback, share with me and I will incorporate that. Um, Let's see. Uh, what do I think the hardest part of building the mirror table concept would be? So I think so he's referring um, to um, this a post that I that I wrote. Uh, if you go to balgs.com, um, it's called. I think it's a. It's a balgs.com uh, mirror table, right? And I'll just paste it here. Um, and, uh, so basically what I think the hardest part of building it, it's very country specific because essentially, you know, there's quite a few crypto exchanges now around the world and each one has to tackle, you know, American law for the U S exchange or Indian law for the Indian exchange or UK law for the British exchange. And that's a, that's a whole thing to do because there's idiosyncrasies of every country and regulatory relationships and, and all that type of stuff. Right. And so what is the hardest part of building the mirror table? Um, it's going to, it's going to be understanding all of that fiat legal stuff and then bring it into the crypto context. And that's why I call it a mirror table, just like a stable coin, um, is kind of carefully phrased. It's like a coin, but it's price remains stable. The mirror table is a mirror of an off chain, uh, offline rather the mirror table is a mirror of an off chain cap table. Um, and uh, just like the stable coin is just a mirror of that fiat currency, but then you can do stuff with it on chain, but then eventually you back it out back to fiat. You assume fiat exists. The mirror table is like a convenient state structure, probably for, I don't know, 10 years until people get comfortable enough with it that it flips over so that the, uh, you know, that becomes primary. So the hardest part is understanding individual countries' law. I wouldn't try to do it for every country at once because you're built, it's like building a fiat 
to crypto interface, except for, for companies. <clears throat> how to become a better founder? Um, how do you get the chance of being CTO of Coinbase? Uh, well, I mean, like Coinbase didn't exist, you know, eight years ago, nine years ago, right? Um, so uh, I guess 2012 is when I was found. Okay, 10 years ago. So all this stuff is just done by folks just like you and me. Um, and, you know, how do you become a, a better founder? I mean, this is the thing I, I've I actually talked about this. Um, you know, being a founder is so hard and it's so, you know, taxing in some ways that um, you really only want to do it if you're trying to build something you can't buy. Okay. Elon cannot buy a trip to Mars. Hence, he's building SpaceX. Okay. And if there's nothing you feel so, you know, passionate about that you're trying to build something you can't buy, then you should just get a job at Google or Facebook or whatever and, and just have a high salary and, and I don't know, have avocado toast, whatever the, the things that people do. Right. It's a very different kind of personality nowadays that joins Google or, you know, Amazon or whatever than, than did 10 or 20 years ago when that was, that was a pioneering thing to do. Now that's a very safe job. Right. Um, and so the answer is, you know, to become a, a founder, you need to really have a passion that drives you. And I'm not saying that in like the trivial way. I mean, like you really need to build something that you can't buy. And if you're okay with buying it, then just buy it um, or maybe just invest or whatever. Right. Um, I would sort of, I shouldn't say for folks who would think it's like romantic to be an operator or some, or a founder or something like that. Operators, what VCs sometimes will call founders. But founders usually don't call themselves operators. Um, it's not, it's like, it's you, 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 it's like, it's like, I don't know. It's like uh, joining the NBA or something like that. Um, lots of people fail for the ones that you see succeeding. And even the people who you think quote suck are actually often really, really, really good. <clears throat> the guy in the NBA with the three point per game scoring average could destroy everybody in a high school gym, you know? And so in the same way, any product that you think sucks is actually a product that you've used. And so it's therefore past this enormous natural selection process to at least get you to try it out because there's a huge difference between that versus something somebody can cook up in a, in a few seconds. Right. So um, so it's hard. And I, I would say, just don't even try it unless you, uh, it, it's like the guru on the mountaintop who's, who like rejects somebody three times before they come back. Don't even try doing it unless you, you have a lot of grit and determination. Um, for web three social media, what do you think the future will look like? Why would users using web two socials transfer to web three version? Well, uh, there's, there's different reasons for this. The first reason, the number one, I mean, simplest reason why something like ENS will, uh, you know, or SNS or something like that will eventually dominate is when you log in with your Facebook or Google account, there's no balance, right? You just have your email. It's the lightest way possible thing. You might share your email address or some profile information, but every site wants you to be able to log in and buy things from them. That alone, just the fact that when you log in with your crypto username, you have a spendable balance. First of all, shows you that Facebook and Google with all their muscle and billions of users somehow could not get a global spendable balance working on all these websites, okay? Which shows part of the problem cryptocurrency solves. Second, it shows how open that is, okay? You should read this post called, you know, the billion user table. Let me uh, put that in this chat so that you can see it. Um, and this goes into more detail on this, but um, it basically talks about what happens when you've got these giant user tables that just liquefy and start becoming liquid and moving between companies very easily. Um, if and when that happens, uh, you've you've got a huge thing where now um, companies don't have lock-in anymore. They need to appeal to loyalty. The companies become more like tribes, um, and uh, it's 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 becomes a scarce resource by 2030 or so. Um, so the future of it, what, what does the future look like? It's a social media platform plus a cryptocurrency plus a community plus a this plus a that. It's not. It's it's like vertically integrated, and eventually it's like something that controls territory. It's got, um, you know, a, like land, or then eventually a city, or even a country, like I talk about in the network state. So it gets vertically integrated because now we've got you know because of the progress of technology, people know what a working social media platform looks like. They know what a working payments app looks like. They know what a working chat app looks like. So that gets vertically integrated. And so you have these sort of digital communities that are that are fully contained, that you can live in, that you can work in, that you can get hired in, um, that you can apply to. And I think that's the future as opposed to just having like individual slices, we start vertically integrating. Just like the iPhone was like a convergence device that 
integrated a camera and a GPS thing. Cause you used to have an independent GPS, like a Garmin thing, or you'd have a camera, you'd have a camcorder, you'd have a compass, you'd have maps. Um, <clears throat> there's like 20, 30 different devices that the smartphone integrated into one thing. And I think something similar is going to happen with Web3 social media, a bunch of things get integrated. Um, <clears throat> any opinion about app specific L2s and rollups? Um, I, I think we're going to basically see all of the above, right? Like, um, I'm not sure about app specific L2s. Uh, I mean, actually app chains could be, you could implement app chains as L1s or L2s, depending. Um, I've seen both. Um, I, I, I think it's just, it's one of those things where you can throw a theory at it, but it's going to be application specific. I mean, one way of thinking about it is, uh, this great post, which is something like, PHP sucks, and it's also uh, used by a billion people, right? Um, yeah, here it is. It's like uh, taking PHP seriously. Um, and it is like, uh, most pra programmers have only casually used PHP know two things about it, that A, it is a bad language that they would never use if given the choice, and B, that some of the most extraordinarily successful projects in history use it. This is not quite a contradiction, but it should make us curious. In Facebook, Wikipedia, WordPress, Etsy, Baidu, Box, and more recently Slack, all succeed in spite of using PHP, right? That's funny, right? And the point is that sometimes, I mean, the technology choice is less than the execution, right? Okay. Um, so oh, let me try clicking this. What do I think about the current uh, NFT Fi ecosystem? Um, I think the pricing of NFTs is very challenging and it's different than fungible token pricing because often these are illiquid markets with stale marks, you know, like you've got the last sale was quite a long time ago. Um, on NFTs, uh, you know, you should follow Punk6529. Um, he will, you know, probably disagree with some of this, probably agree with some of this. I, you know, I, I've chatted with him and, you know, we, we co-invest in some stuff. Uh, here's where I have faith in NFTs right now. I have faith in ENS. I think that's real. And the NFT aspect is secondary to the utility. I do think that NFT communities could be real um, where the value is not so much in the in the piece of art, the profile photo, but in the community that it gets you a login into, sort of like a, a membership to the Freemasons or you know being part of an HOA, right? Um, and I think that uh, NFTs, as you know, for what I call crypto credentials, like you know an NFT diploma or an NFT this, NFT that, um, I think those could be quite good. And I think there's lots of sort of you know tchotchkes or or, or knickknacks that you might get as NFT is like, just get a little NFT badge for doing this or doing that, right? You kind of collect that stuff. And it might not actually be these giant dollar value things where this huge amount of speculation pull people in. Um, I think within, you know, one of the interesting interaction effects you're gonna get in the next few years is AI plus NFTs. Why? Because with all of this AI image and video generation, no one is gonna know what's real on the internet. You're gonna actually look for the crypto blue check which is the NFT. And so, you know, to know that that is the real person and not the AI version, you'll have a blue check floating over them that you can click and be like, oh, okay, they're wearing the clothes in this metaverse game, or that's the account in this game that only this person has. There's a digital signature that lets me see what is real online. And so that concept of the chain check is, I think, how people are gonna make sense of the hall of mirrors that AI is gonna create online. Um, so now that's not exactly a direct answer on NFT Fi, but that's sort of where I think the utility of NFTs comes in and you can maybe back out what is valuable from that. I'm less, I mean, I'm, I'm not like a trader, uh, you know, I'm not like a financier per se, you know, like I'll exit positions at times, but, you know, for the most part, I'm really a seed investor, just buy and hold for many years. So, I mean, DeFi is fine. And I think it's 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 good that it's around or whatever, it's just not something that I've ever been quite passionate about. Um, but it, I think if you nail the utility, then you can build a financial system on top of it. So just speaking to NFT utility there. Um, wow, quite a lot of questions. All right, can keep going. Um, what are some drawbacks that Filecoin is facing and needs to be tackled in the decentralized file service industry? Um, you know, like Juan Benet would be probably better positioned to answer that. I don't know every, you know, the very latest on Filecoin, but um, I do think IPFS has real traction, which is, you know, the the underlying file system versus the kind of monetization thing on top. Um, I know, I, you know, th there's uh, ultimately as, 
you know, block space keeps increasing as decentralized storage more generally keeps increasing, this will get more and more useful for things. Clearly, people are seeing centralized platforms having files taken off or you know, demonetized or what have you. So there is a medium to long-term push for something that might seem incredibly excessive, which is like replicated file storage starts to become more and more necessary. Just as a small example, um, you know, like the whole uh, lab leak theory of COVID was super controversial two years ago and might've been, you know, something where people would have been deplatformed or have the files taken down or something like that. And then a few years later, it's almost conventional wisdom, at least it's certainly within the Overton window to discuss it. So that's the kind of thing where storing those files on something like Filecoin or, I, or IPFS would be good. Um, so I think the need for it just keeps expanding. Uh, I think the challenge is just, I don't know, making, maybe making it more user-friendly, having a Dropbox like interface for Filecoin, um, you know, just spilling a lot of the tooling around it. Uh, Juan will be able to give a better answer on that. Um, so answer live, done, all right. Uh, how to raise, if some other people are already doing it, should it prevent me from doing it? No, uh, there's a lot of capital out there still. It's hard, it's hard to find fundraise. It depends on kind of what you're trying to do. Um, but uh, basically, um, I mean, it's, it's very specific to your situation. Um, I can't really give an answer to this other than, you know, fundraise if you need to fundraise. Don't fundraise if you don't need to fundraise. Um, don't do it just for the sake of doing it. Uh, do I think Bitcoin requires a tail emission to be secure two thirds halvings down the line? No, um, I, I do think that, um, I think it's going to be interesting just to see what happens with the distribution of a price, B mining revenue, C fee revenue. Um, and there's different people have different mental models in theory, if it, you know, doubles every four years in price then you know it gets secured or you know maybe like you know fees just start becoming wildly expensive and that's also possible like on chain like actually sending a transaction on the bitcoin blockchain may be a very rare thing that is only done when you're sending huge amounts of money in the future that's another possibility um i i think it's i think it's sort of premature to talk about that now um but uh you know it kind of depends on your envelope of what you think the future is on that um, I don't have a strong opinion on it, other than I don't think that there should be any inflation of it. Uh, but I, you know, I shouldn't say hopefully. I do think fees will probably rise to provide enough security, but but we will see. Um, next one: companies like Cortex integrate AI into their smart contracts. Is it possible to integrate AI into DAO and let the company be managed by AI? If it's possible, how the legal obligation should be enforced? I think something like this will eventually happen, but it's boy, is that hard, right? You know, you have to anticipate every possible input, and you know, uh, if that AI is inflexible, there's there's ways. You know, people have talked about um, adversarial images where you can put up something that just has some weird pixel difference and it'll fool an AI, um, but it wouldn't fool a human. Um, and so it's something where uh, you, you're building the image. If you have the back end of the AI model, you can you can see what the AI is seeing, and you can you know create these adversarial images. Now, now imagine that that's something which is uh, like guarding money, right? Um, doesn't seem like that's robust enough yet, uh, you know. But um, I, I, in a sense, one of the really big things that Satoshi managed to pull off is a game where everybody knows the rules, but still can't game. Um, and meaning, you know, the Bitcoin mining quote game, right? Um, those are very hard to develop. Most games where everybody knows the rules start to get game. For example, the game of getting backlinks to rank at the top of Google, you have a Goodhart's Law phenomenon where the metric, which is quality, that is proxied by the easier metric of backlinks, starts getting game once people know that backlinks are the metric to game. So I'm not saying it's impossible. I think it's a really hard problem to have money managed fully by an AI. If you say partially by an AI, absolutely. You know, Trading bots are essentially that. Um, but then they're sort of like dogs, you know, that, that are on a leash, like robot dogs that you're controlling. And that if it's doing something dumb, you can yank it back or retrain it or something like that. And, you know, it's, they're intelligent agents, but not fully autonomous, partially autonomous. Yes. Fully autonomous. I think very difficult because of the adversarial stuff. Um, 
Would you recommend building startups that are 100% Web3 or to widen the target audience to make it easier for Web2 users to conveniently use a product? Um, you know, like there's different opinions on this and I think you can be successful in both. But I actually do think that um, thinking of Web3 as like a country is a useful, a country that's expanding is a useful way of thinking about it. Um, in the sense, it's sort of like saying, should you start in Japan or go go global from the start? Well, you might want to start in Japan and you build to that cultural context. And maybe if you're just big in Japan, you'll be pretty big. But now imagine that Japan is 120 million people today, but it might be 1.2 billion people in 10 or 15 years, right? Then the product that you're building today that assumes Web3 is, you know, it, it works for this demographic and then it works for many more people in the future, right? Okay. Um, crypto projects at the moment offers a lot of favorable terms to private market investors while crypto, you know, create new elites who become the monopoly. Um, you know, the thing about this is uh, very few firms actually from, you know, previous iterations of, of Sand Hill made the leap into crypto. Most of the crypto firms, Paradigm, Polychain, Multicoin, you know, Electric Capital, Block Tower, et cetera, most of them are actually new firms. Um, so, so it is quote a new elite, but it is a new elite. And, um, that's, that's actually kind of important in, in the sense of, uh, you know, the fact that the new boss is not the same as the old boss is itself decentralizing. Cause it's not the old, not, not like the old boss doesn't exist. Right. Basically, if you have the USD hierarchy and you create a new crypto hierarchy and 50% of the values in both of them, you have actually reduced inequality that way because you've created multiple hierarchies, multiple ways of, of getting out. Then you have the ETH hierarchy and you have the this hierarchy. So, um, so I think that actually creating multiple ladders is actually good and actually inequality decreasing. Um, it doesn't mean that all inequality goes away, but it does mean you have multiple paths to leveling up. And I think that's on net better. Um, so what do I think of retroactive funding versus more traditional grants? Um, so I assume like, you know, retroactive funding is it's like, uh, you know, basically giving people almost like a prize for their past work versus more traditional grants. I mean, the thing is, depending on what you're talking about, traditional grants, like academic grants, for example, are largely based on past work. Like in academia, pretty much what you're proposing can be done has to sort of be 70% done to get the grant. And then what happens is you use the grant, not for that project, but for the future project, that's totally uncertain because to de-risk it so much, um, you have to put in so much proof into the, into the write-up that um, you're, you're, you're able to like get the grant, right? That's academia is like sort of bizarre like this, okay? So traditional grants actually have a significant retroactive component. And in general, I'm actually not super enthusiastic about retroactive funding. I think actually you want to go, maybe go the opposite direction, which is proactive funding, funding the person, like the Teal Fellowship, as opposed to the project. I mean, I think both are good, person funding and prize funding. I'm, I'm pretty bearish on the traditional grants process because I think it's just bureaucratic, you know, glad handing. But anyway, that's that's where I'm at on that. Um, boy, a lot of questions. All right, I'll keep going. All right, Dawn, tell me when to stop. I'll just gonna keep going. <clears throat> Can you elaborate on the global security issues and shifting power that impact the space? How do you power through these barriers in your day to day? Um, well, I just powered through five barriers before breakfast this morning. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so um, what do I what do I do? Uh, I don't know. I think. Um, Uh, this is something where there's there's both a, just like there is a reformation and a counter reformation. There's a decentralization and there's a counter decentralization. There's a counter counter decentralization. Um, you know, every action is a reaction. Soros talks about this as a concept of reflexivity. Um, I think the the answer on this is basically um, You have to build a large enough coalition to get through any political roadblocks that arise. You need to build a large enough coalition to get through those political roadblocks. And that doesn't have to be a traditional coalition, which is, you know, show up on the polling day. It can be a coalition of opinion. It can be a global coalition where exit is a much bigger component than just lobbying within one state. Um, you know, this is a really big question. I think uh, what you might do is read my article, Great Protocol Politics, and another article called... Um, here, I'll put both these in there in the chat. So there's this one. You can use archive.is to see these, but um, uh, 
read those two. Um, and maybe that'll give some helpful, that's both foreign and domestic context. Could I elaborate a little bit on the decentralized identity and authentication problem? Yeah, so read that post called the billion user table, um, which is uh, which is you know in the chat. But um, basically, the lightest weight way to decentralize social media is have everything else centralized, but allow people to export their profiles. And um, so, if you look at how ENS works, you can get like passport stamps on ENS. People can write to ENS, and you can port it between sites. Whereas when you export, for example, from Facebook or from Twitter, the data structure that you get is a totally different data structure. Um, also read this post like, um, you know, uh, yes, you may need a blockchain, right? Um, and this post kind of talks about the backend engineering aspects of it. So people are like, no, you never need a blockchain. I'm like, uh, well, if you need shared data between systems, if you need incentivized shared data between systems, which is actually pretty important, um, that's what that's what blockchains do, and decentralized identity is a helpful way of getting there. Well, this is a ton of good open problems. How do I choose which one to go after? Um, I mean, uh, you could you you should have to form your own ranking. You could do it in terms of what you know or what you're interested in, or or or, or anything like that. Um, so. I don't know. Market opportunity is one way of ranking it, or you know where your skill set is. You'll have to choose your own ranking. I can't. I can't do the start for you. Um, so on DAO decentralization, do you think identifying where the most centralized cog is more valuable, or identifying the most efficient is more valuable for the near future? Um, I don't fully understand this question, um, but uh, I think the most efficient is by, by DAO line metrics. Um, I I think maybe th this is asking how to allocate resources to decentralize, and uh, I think it might be I don't know maybe it's a hundred thousand dollars to or two hundred thousand or whatever it is to train a new developer, but it's a million dollars to get a new miner online, and you can trade off between those if you have a measure of decentralization that incorporates both. Um, I don't fully understand this question, so tell me if that's a, the right answer. Um, Will the Web3 metaverse replace traditional social media? Um, I think that you have a convergence of A, social media, B, chat apps like Slack and Discord, C, video games, uh, D, augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and that's like the metaverse. And then E, like crypto and DAOs. Uh, does it replace traditional social media? I mean, like Craigslist is still around, right? Reddit is still around. Um, Yahoo is even still around. It's less less than what it was. So a lot of Web 1 or early Web 2 stuff is still around. So I kind of think that 2D interface will probably be there for a while, but given how many people are working remote and stuff like that, uh, you, you will probably spend more time than... I mean, for example, with Zoom, this would probably be better done in VR. Why? Because you know the, the video is like, okay, but in VR, it's like, it's, you know, right now we're just sort of scanning an environment, a 2D environment, putting it on a screen. It's sort of, it's like, okay. But if it's in VR, everyone can kind of relax a little bit more um, and you can hit buttons and you can have fireworks on screen. It's more visually engaging. So I'm not sure it replaces all of traditional social media, but certainly for example, things like video chat or where you're at your computer and you're highly engaged. Um, I think, I think it could. Um, what are some drawbacks and challenges tokenizing traditional financial assets like loans? Well, drawbacks, Things like flash loans, for example, enable totally new kinds of attacks um, because you've never been able to like take out a loan and then use it for something and then return it in the same like clock cycle and whatnot. That's like that's amazing stuff. Um, in some ways, also you know just just unlocks new things. Um, but the pro is is it challenges. There's all kinds of legal challenges across different countries. But the pro is basically that maybe anybody in any country can just open up a phone and get a loan if they need you know capital for something. Now, money lending, you know, obviously you just don't want to get in debt in general, um, but it's a power user tool. Uh, and, uh, you know, the it is both good that people can get capital easily and it's bad because there's lots of ways you can misuse that, blow off your foot with it, but it's also something where, um, you know, there can be very productive loans, you know, and so... Uh, you know, I think the drawbacks and challenges are more social than technical, and we just need to figure out the right kind of sort of standards around that. Um, haven't seen much topics in decentralized commerce yet. What would be my thought? 
Well, if you look at the thing I said about CPA with Web3, I think that's important. Um, take a look at what Antonio Garcia Martinez is doing. That gives an incentive for crypto people or uh, vendors to accept crypto. Any open problems specific to GameFi that come to your mind? Well, I am, you know, like blockchain-based games. I mean, the thing is, there's a lot of pushback against it because people, many people don't want games to become like work. Um, and there's their concern, perhaps rightfully so, about more microtransaction-like stuff in the games that cost some money. They go to games to just veg out and relax. They don't want the whole industry to move towards something that's more pay-to-win type stuff, right? They want it to be fun, not like a job. On their hand, rather than workifying games, rather than making games more like work, I think a better concept might be to gamify work, to make work more like games rather than making games more like work. So you make the next Slack or the next Discord be something that's more game-like and that, you know, now it's something work, a work context where you earn crypto stuff for doing things might be better. So I think that might be the right angle of attack, but just a hypothesis. Um, what are some security trends that could help combat the fraud scams in Web3? Um, the problem originates from using status quo op or paid crypto wallets. I actually think that um, the, um, the uh, security trends we don't think about it this way, but there's, a, for example, there's a site called Rekt News, R E K T dot N E W S. Okay. And this is like a site which just goes through all of these hacks and the postmortems. It's like um, some of these are $10 million, $100 million hacks. Right. And the thing about that is um, this is churning out combat veterans. Okay. All existing Web2 systems are actually much less secure than people think. That's why, you know, the US government, the Chinese government, they just get hacked over and over and over again. OPM gets hacked, um, DOD gets hacked, uh, Texas gets hacked. You can Google all the government hacks that are out there. Okay. Whereas Bitcoin and Ethereum are not hacked. They're they're public, they're open state. Okay. And frankly, the thing is that right now that with the government or any institution thinks about making something hack proof is they think it's policy based. Like, oh, if we just yell at enough people and shake enough people by the shoulders, or we have some ISO 9000 type security checklist, we're going to be secure. Whereas actually that, that has nothing to do with it. It's like wearing a suit to code. You know, the suit doesn't do anything. You have to actually get the code right. You might want to be comfortable before you code. And so really what you want for a secure platform is something that's being highly penetration tested for real money over many years. And so I think what actually happens in the medium to long run is that the only secure backends are on chain, meaning the frauds and scams and stuff that we see today are actually an expensive but necessary hardening process for a genuinely adversarial internet of tomorrow. And the only backends that are secure are those that are on chain, meaning they're the only ones that are actually penetration tested to the tune of hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And therefore, though it's imperfect, the market cap of a coin that hasn't been hacked for five or 10 years is actually a decent metric, not perfect. There's many exceptions to this, but it's a better metric than an ISO 9000 audit as to whether something's actually secure. So I think that's the answer. I mean, now in terms of specific tools, there's stuff I funded like, you know, Sertora, for example, for formal verification, there's guys like Spearbit, you know, or um, Trail of Bits and stuff like that, that do various kinds of security audits. Um, basically in crypto, unlike web two and web three, unlike web two, you have to take security seriously. In web two, you could set security to zero, launch service, get a bunch of users, then add security later. But if you have lots of security and no users, then you're nowhere. In web three though, if you don't have security on your smart contract, you can get hacked at the beginning. And that's actually very dangerous. Um, and so it's a very difficult problem. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is something though, where basically, uh, you know, the late Dan Kaminsky, who's really great and he's a great guy. And he was one of the first people who wrote about Bitcoin um, had this really great post called, I couldn't hack Bitcoin and that was exciting. Um, and what he said was basically, here, this is it. Um, very, very, very well written post. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, so um, Dan wrote this post, um, and uh, split screen apology. Right. I mean, like you're seeing my my face, right? Not not slides. Yes, no. Okay. 
Um, okay. So, um, well, so basically, uh, this this post with by Dan essentially says that most kinds of things which implement pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for anybody who can hack it will just fail utterly in every possible way. And he was impressed when he looked at the code because he was like, wait a second, this guy understood the scale of the problem. He didn't push it off or say we add security later. Every single thing was built from the very beginning to be an ultra secure Fort Knox of a system. That's just a different mentality of how you write code. Um, security is not, not an option. Um, and, and so that's, that is different than all the web two code that's out there. So I basically reverse the question and I'd say, um, and this is actually China in, in my view, one of their very long-term vulnerabilities by the 2030s or 2040s is by banning web three, um, they will not have access to the most secure backends. You just, it's sort of like somebody who doesn't work out, you know, for 10 years, they, they don't have daily pain. Yes. But they, what they sacrifice is at the end of those 10 years, they're really out of shape and, um, the daily pain, you know, that, that was better than having like end of life pain or whatever. Right. So, all right. Lightning round. That was about like 30 different questions. Um, how was that? Great. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Apologic. Can you hear me now? I know. Yes, I can. Audio. Wow. I much better audio. Better. Much, much right. better. Audio. Okay. okay. Great. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much for the amazing lecture and the amazing Q and A. So maybe we can close the, the class with one final question. So your book network states, has been, it's a fascinating book and has been a huge success. So could you yes. also share with the audience a little bit about the actual process of your writing the book and also some of the most important lessons that you have learned since the book was published? Sure, sure. So um, the network state, basically, uh, I will actually just put something on screen so people can see what it is. Um, can you guys see the screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So um, let me, I'll just show, explain what the network state is in one image and then one GIF and then talk about it. So the network state concept is what if you had a social network? Okay. And now we're showing it on a map, all the nodes of a social network. And those groups of people that are in, let's say, New York uh, or Tokyo are crowdfunding buildings or even small towns and living together. And they think of themselves as a country where their collective population, income, and real estate footprint is comparable to that of a legacy nation state, okay? And the tools for this are now available. We have obviously smartphones and we have social media and we have cryptocurrency and we have remote work and, and so on. And they're just gonna keep getting better, okay? You go from remote work to remote life to remote states. You decentralize not just the currency, but the state itself, right? And this is how you'd build up one starting with one person in Tokyo and then like 17, 172, 1729, right? And and so on. This is how the next Zuck could start with just one person and literally build not a company or a community or a currency, but a country online. And you see the, you know, in this like little visual, the sophistication of the buildings it goes from one person to a house and a few people, you know, and, and these buildings start getting more elaborate as you're having, you know, thousand and ten thousand person groups living together, right? And with the internet, you can network these enclaves together so they feel like one place. Just like, you know, Hawaii is 2000 miles away from the continental US, but people on both sides think of it as part of the same country. So too, could you have, you know, piece of land separated not by ocean, but by internet that think of themselves as the same country. And so this is the concept of the network state. And, you know, I've given various talks and stuff on it. In terms of the book writing process, um, so let me actually, I'll stop screen share for a second. Um, um, in terms of book writing process, um, I did it all in Emacs uh, with a, with an org file. Um, if you guys know org mode, um, managed in GitHub, had a build process that generated uh, an EPUB for Kindle and a PDF file and a, um, you know, markdown, which we then loaded into this uh, website that we built. Um, and, uh, you know, Greg Fodor and Elijah Madonia, you know, uh, did the coding and the, some of the aesthetics on the website. So basically three of us kind of worked on that. And, um, you know, Greg was the lead engineer. How long was the writing process? Right. How, oh, how writing process. In a sense, it was, in a sense, it was 10 years. In a sense, it was a few months. Um, you know, so, you know, I gave this talk, uh, Silicon Valley's ultimate exit, um, years ago. 
And um, basically it was something which, oops. Silicon Valley's ultimate exit years ago. And um, this was pretty popular talk, right? And um, it was also somewhat, you know, criticized at the time, but it was, it was it was loved by people in tech and it was disliked by people on the East Coast. But I think if you go back and watch it, I think it holds up pretty well today. Um, there are certain things, you know, that were difficult to see at that time that, you know, for example, that Satya would take over Microsoft and turn it around and, and whatnot. But I think overall, from the vantage point of, you know, November 2013, I feel that talk holds up quite well. And so in a sense, I've been kind of writing the book for 10, 10 years or more. Um, in a sense, you know, just a few months of just finalizing it and shipping it. And then in terms of the most important lessons that you have learned since the book uh, was published. So the most important lessons are, I mean, it took a long time for Google to go from capital G Google to like Googling the lowercase word, like searching. And it took a long time for Uber to go from Uber the car to Ubering around. But the network state has gone from capital N network state to lowercase, like a concept that people are talking about. It's being injected into the bloodstream. Um, I do think it is the next thing after, you know, uh, starting your own company like Google and Amazon or starting your own community like Facebook and Twitter or starting your own currency like Bitcoin and Ethereum, starting your own city or even your own country. I do think that's what's next. I don't think, I don't think the internet stops. At just coins and tokens, as great as they are, as much as I love them, I don't think that's what that's that's the end of the road. All right, this internet thing is going places, and um, and the and like if you think about where starting new coins was ten years ago, it was considered insane that you could um, have transfer of sovereignty right from a fiat state to a cryptocurrency. That's basically happened at least partially in many jurisdictions, um, and so this is kind of the next step. What have I learned from it? The appeal of it. By, by having it go into the bloodstream, um, it, the appeal of it is much, it's much broader than I had even thought. For example, there's folks in Catalonia, Catalonia nationalists who are saying this might be a third way rather than just, you know, being under a government that they don't like or having some sort of really messy independence movement. The third way might be, okay, my, maybe we can sacrifice on the land, but get a state just like there's more Irish people that live outside of Ireland than within Ireland. And each of these you know, that's like one example of, um, you know, a, a group of folks who have, have really taken to this that are further afield from crypto, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, there's folks who probably disagree with me on 70% of things. And one of the things I wrote about in the book is I said, it's a toolbox, not a manifesto. So you might disagree with me on a lot of stuff, but you might still find something useful there and you find some piece of it useful that I'm happy. Um, what am I going to do for the V2? I'm probably, you know, I may have mentioned this already, but I, I'm going to factor it as motivation theory practice so that I kind of try to factor out all of my views into just like a module at the beginning, which is why I think we should build new countries. But then lots of people have different reasons. And then that's a coalition of people for doing it. And if, you know, you can agree with the premise of, you know, people should be able to start new countries and they should be able to self-determine and come together in the communities on the internet that are their actual neighbors, as opposed to their physical neighbors who they often don't know, right? Um, and then, you know, kind of reconcile those by migrating to be near those, those, those people who share the same values, right? This great migration that I think is going to happen. Um, if, if, if you believe in that, then, you know, you, you basically believe in a lot of the principles of the network state. And uh, so that's like, you know, motivation, theory, and then practice like brass tacks and much more on that. But I think as a V1, it's, it's been pretty good and it's gotten, it's simulated the right discussion. Um, it's, you know, it's given away free online, but it's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. There's a, you know, you can read a ton of like reviews or commentary. If you go to um, this site, there's like hundreds of tweets on it or made thousands actually at this point. Um, so you can scroll that for a while. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's an absolutely a fascinating book. And many people are waiting for the audiobook version. Yes. So what's the yeah, status? Yeah. Um, Working on it. It's going to come. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll, I, I will announce it and release it. And I think hopefully it'll be pretty big. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Balaji, for this uh, amazing uh, guest lecture.
uh, with the amazing presentation and uh, amazing right, Q and A session. Thank you so much for joining All right. us. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Yes. Yeah. Everyone yeah, can check out the book. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.